Well, good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this fourth day of October, day 278 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Hunter. I am your brother, your Bible reading coach, somebody who shows up with you every day to spend a little time together in the pages of the scriptures. And we're going to let these scriptures do what they do and point the way to the one who is the living word of God. The one alone who has the words of life. And so we gather here every day to warm our hearts by the fires of his love. For rest assured, my friend, that is who he is. And today we are in the book of Esther. That's where we'll start chapters 1 and 2, then on to Psalm 150. And we'll finish our reading in Luke's gospel, chapter 17. I'm glad you're here. Esther chapter 1 These events happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. At that time Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Medea, as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. The celebration lasted 180 days, a tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. When it was all over, the king gave a banquet for all the people, from the greatest to the least, who were in the fortress of Susa. It lasted for seven days and was held in the courtyard of the palace garden. The courtyard was beautifully decorated with white cotton curtains and blue hangings, which were fastened with white linen cords and purple ribbons to silver rings embedded in marble pillars. Gold and silver conches stood on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Drinks were served in gold goblets of many designs, and there was an abundance of royal wine reflecting the king's generosity. By edict of the king, no limits were placed on the drinking for the king had instructed all his palace officials to serve each man as much as he wanted. At the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine, he told the seven eunuchs who attended him, Mahuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abgatha, Zethar, and Karkas, to bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman. But when they conveyed the king's order to Queen Vashti, she refused to come. This made the king furious, and he burned with anger. He immediately consulted with his wise advisers, who knew all the Persian laws and customs, for he always asked their advice. The names of these men were Kershena, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Meres, Mersana, and Memurkan, seven nobles of Persia and Medea. They met with the king regularly and held the highest positions in the empire. What must be done to Queen Vashti? the king demanded. What penalty does the law provide for a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders properly sent through his eunuchs? Mamukhan answered the king and his nobles. Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also every noble and citizen throughout your empire. Women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands when they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. Before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Medea will hear what the queen did and will start treating their husbands the same way. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. So if it please the king, we request you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes, and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. When this decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. The king and his nobles thought this made good sense, 
So he followed Mamukhan's counsel. He sent letters to all the parts of the empire, to each province in its own script and language, proclaiming that every man should be the ruler of his own home and should say whatever he pleases. Esther 2 But after Xerxes' anger had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree he had made. So his personal attendant suggested, Let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Hegaya, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, will see that they are all given beauty treatments. After that, the young woman who most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king. So he put the plan into effect. At that time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of Kish and Shemaiah. His family had been among those who, with King Jehoiachin of Judah, had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his own family and raised her as his own daughter. As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Hegiah's care. Hegiah was impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her and provided her with beauty treatments. He also assigned her seven maids especially chosen from the king's palace and he moved her and her mate into the best place in the harem. Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and her family background, because Mordecai had directed her not to do so. Every day Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. Before each young woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed twelve months of beauty treatments, six months with oil of myrrh, followed by six months of special perfumes and ointments. When it was time for her to go to the king's palace, she was given her choice of whatever clothing or jewelry she wanted to take from the harem. That evening, she was taken to the king's private rooms, and the next morning, she was brought to the second harem, where the king's wives lived. There she would be under the care of Shashagaz, the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines. She would never go to the king again unless he especially enjoyed her and requested her by name. Esther was the daughter of Abihail, who was Mordecai's uncle. Mordecai had adopted his younger cousin Esther. When it was Esther's turn to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing except what he suggested, and she was admired by everyone who saw her. Esther was taken to King Xerxes at the royal palace in early winter of the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. To celebrate the occasion, he gave a great banquet in Esther's honor for all his nobles and officials, declaring a public holiday for the provinces and gave generous gifts to everyone. Even after all the young women had been transferred to the second harem and Mordecai had become a palace official, Esther continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. She was still following Mordecai's directions, just as she did when she lived in his home. One day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthana and Teresh, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were impaled on a sharpened pole. This was all recorded in the book of the history of King Xerxes' reign. Psalm 150 Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heaven. 
Praise him for his mighty works. Praise his unequaled greatness. Praise him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Luke 17. One day Jesus said to his disciples, There will always be temptations to sin. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? It would be better to be thrown into the sea with a millstone hung around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourselves. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. Then if there's repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. The apostle said to the Lord, Show us how to increase our faith. The Lord answered, If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, May you be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. When a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, Come in and eat with me? No. He says, Prepare my meal. Put on your apron and serve me while I eat. Then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria, and he entered a village there. Ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us! He looked at them and said, Go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, Praise God! He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, When will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, The kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, Here it is, or it's over there. For the kingdom of God is already among you. Then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see the day when the Son of Man returns, but you won't see it. People will tell you, Look, there's the Son of Man, or here he is, but don't go out and follow them. For as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other, so it will be on the day when the Son of Man comes. But first, the Son of Man must suffer terribly and be rejected by this generation. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days, the people enjoyed banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat, and the flood came and destroyed them all. And the world will be as it was in the days of Lot. People went about their daily business, eating and drinking, buying and selling, farming and building, until... The morning lot left Sodom. Then fire and burning sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Yes, it will be business as usual, right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, a person out on a deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return home. Remember what happened to Lot's wife. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. And if you let your life go, you will save it. That night, two people will be asleep in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour together at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Where will this happen, Lord? The disciples asked. Jesus replied, Just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. And now may our Lord 
give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. There's an aha moment coming. Things are happening behind the scenes in human history. God's at work. But often in the moment, it doesn't look that way. But rest assured, he's expertly arranging his story to work out just as he planned. And one day, there's going to be a giant aha moment. And it's going to become very clear. Esther reminds us of this in this amazing little book. God's name is never mentioned, and yet his hand is seen in every word and every line. And when we look at it from the end, when we see it from its conclusion, it becomes so obvious to us. Then it's one giant massive, aha, of course, look how God was arranging things. Look how he was scheduling things just so. It's not just true in Esther's life. Our lives are like that too. It may not be so obvious in the moment, but in the end, when our life and story conclude, we will see that he was there the whole time. We will have that aha moment. We will see and we will know and we will be known. So it is in human history itself. When it concludes, we will see that God was at work through it all. It'll be like no other aha moment the world has ever known when we see the kingdom of God fully arrived. Until then, we can live with that aha moment in mind. That's what living by faith is. It's trusting in God, even when it doesn't seem like he's here. It's not obvious that he's at work. That's why we come to the word of God every day. Esther and the prophets are reminding us that there is an aha coming. If we pay close attention and we look at the word carefully, we can see glimpses of what he's up to. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. God is at work. His hand is all over your story, right there in the thick of it. It's hard to see sometimes, hard to recognize most times. But at the story's conclusion, it's one giant aha, of course, God. You were with me all the time. You never let me go. Live with this perspective today, that there's an aha coming. Hold closely to the word, to the living word. Let it drive you to the living word until that day comes. And that's the prayer that I have for my own soul. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, my son. And that's a prayer that I have for you. May it be so. And now, let us pray. Lord God Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, Direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Lord, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned. 
It is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your grateful children, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all you have made. We bless you for your creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, and above all, for your immeasurable love and your redemption of the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. Lord, we pray, give us such awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but with our lives, by the giving up of ourselves for your service in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory through all ages. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, hey, 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 DRB family. We have once again spent a perfectly good 20 minutes opening our hearts to the word of the Lord. And that, my friend, is a habit worth cultivating. In the midst of all today's demands, you took some time for your soul. And that is such a good thing. So good on you, my friends. Let's keep doing that. Let's keep strengthening these habits of the heart. And while I'm talking about habits, let me also remind you that we are in the last stretch before the end of 2024. Many of you started this year with a goal in mind of reading through the entire Bible. And whether you've been able to stay on that track or maybe you've had to relinquish that goal, either way, it is important that we finish this year strong. This would be a good time to just redouble your determination. <laughs> and decide once again that, yeah, I'm going to finish this year out training my heart in the ways of Jesus, opening my ears to hear and receive the good news, to be reminded day in and day out of who I am, what God has done, and what I have become. All those things for the remainder of this year. So let's grab a gear. Let's Reset our focus and let us keep going forward. Well, this podcast is able to go forward because of you, because of our partners, folks that have said, hey, Hunter and Heather, we want to be a part of this. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you to our partners. Thank you to folks like Robin Garcia, Pam Yesian, Tamika Peoples, Kenneth Blevins, Demetrius Donasaro, Robert Bastiani, Helen Carey, Dahlia Hanna, Brian Luz, and Ron and Kim. Blessings to you, my sisters, my brothers, my co-laborers here in this work of the Lord. If you're listening today and you'd like to join that group of folks, man, that is so appreciated and so needed. And all you need to do is head on over to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com, click on the donate link. You'll be on your way. You'll find that same link right in the show notes of today's podcast. So right here on your phone, you can just check that out, click that link and get started partnering with the DRB. And last, if you are old school and you prefer to do things through the U.S. Post, you can reach us at Daily Radio Bible, 2748 Northeast Molini Way, Hillsboro, Oregon, 97124. Well, hey, hey, what do you say we show up again here tomorrow? We'll do it again. That's my plan. Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Your brother Hunter plans on being here. 
Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this. That you are loved. No doubt about that. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.